So, Beer and I have just spent 27 days on expedition in the wilderness of Labrador. I'm just packing up now. We're getting ready to go. The trip is over. Before I do, in no particular order, I'm going to go over some of the gear that I brought along with us. None of this, by the way, is sponsored gear. I got a little support on some items from Lure of the North there in Ontario, Canada. Uh, such as my anorak and the toboggan and my ice chisel and my snowshoes. Just a little bit of support. Still had to pay my way. So this is all gear I've acquired myself. <clears throat> there may have been some gifts in there. First off, the clothing. I brought along two sets of under gear. Heavy wool. 250 weight I believe it is smart wool so here is a pair of pants I have a top on right now during the daytime I was wearing these wool pants <clears throat> they're 28 ounce wool very heavy right now I have nothing on underneath because it's a warm day these are made by Big Bill I do believe so my outer shell my wind shell was this anorak, cotton canvas anorak. Got that from Lure of the North. It has a nice layer of coyote fur around the hood. So you put that up, it kind of traps all the heat in around your face and you create your own little climate in there, a bit of a micro climate. So very good when it gets windy at all. Uh, you put this on and it's like you have your own little portable tent going around on you. If it gets bad enough and you're cold, taking a break, I've brought my arms in through the sleeves because they're very big for that purpose and for ventilation. But I haul both my arms in and put my head down here and I was basically inside the, the anorak when it was windy out, <coughs> uh, checking my GPS. So that's great. So I'll continue with items that I, I would have wore on the average day <clears throat> say minus 15 minus 20 degrees Celsius once it got a fair bit warmer like today I would have removed these pants this base layer and just went with these wool heavy pants because they're warm enough sometimes I'd keep my upper wool layer on with this medium weight wool sweater and then I'd have the anorak over top of it now if I got if I got very warm pulling, even when it was, you know, say minus 10, minus 15, I would remove the anorak. Then I just have this sweater on with the wool base layer. Then there was times where I got so warm when, when the days were getting close to zero and just above zero, where I would wear nothing. I'd take this black shirt off and all I'd have on was this medium weight wool sweater because it breathes well and it's loose. So that was good. I'd also have a pair of these thermo hair socks, they're called, but they would be the my first layer of sock throughout the day, always wearing two pairs of socks, and then I'd put these wool socks, 100%, I think they're lamb's wool or sheep wool. I was given these as a gift by a friend in Newfoundland, and I appreciate it. His mother uh, knit them. So that would be what I wear throughout the day. And then other than that, I would have uh, these wool, 100% wool trigger mitts. These were good. When it got into the, you know, low, uh, under the minus 20s, around the minus 30s, I was wearing these also trigger style mitt. And I'd wear those underneath, and that was perfect out in you know, wind chills in the minus, almost minus 40 one day, and you know, we were out walking around, and uh, just like this. I don't usually have much of an issue with my hands getting very cold. Other people have bad circulation, so maybe just a full-on mitt would be recommended, and I, I do have a pair of those with me as well. That way your fingers are all together and you're... Uh, you're losing less warmth that way. 
So though that would be my glove combination throughout the day. Most times it was just this. Just these gloves like this. And that was fine. And then more often than not, my hands overheat like your head. Some of the first two things to overheat. So I'm always removing my my gloves. And then I would take off my heavy wool beanie, which I had with me, <coughs> with ear flaps. So this would be my daily hat. And I would have this merino wool balaclava. Oh, I had two of these with me. <clears throat> I had a third one which was synthetic, but I'd pull it down. Maybe I'd have it around my neck like that. And I'd have my hat on. So we're getting good protection around my neck, tucked down into my shirt. Uh, some other times when it was cold or I stopped for a break, then I would of course be layering back up to keep my heat. But I'd wear it balaclava style with this over it like here. Okay, so lots of uses for the balaclava. Typically though, the hat was warm enough, the wool hat. But there were some times where it was a bit cold or I was just out for a hike, not pulling the sled, just out snowshoeing around. It wasn't creating as much heat. <clears throat> so I'd want to put the balaclava on underneath. Some other times, I just I would just use the balaclava like you're seeing it now as a bandana. That way I'm shedding heat through the top of my head. <laughs> Something like that. I got a lot of hair on me now, so it's hard to get straight. Some days, even with sunscreen on, I was finding I was my nose and stuff was and my cheeks were burning up. So I was wearing the balaclava like this, just with my, my glasses on, which is another important clothing clothing item and I'll go over soon. But maybe something like this or just leaving my mouth available because I'd breathe through my mouth that way if I went and you've probably seen it now if you cover up your mouth and your nose your glasses are going to start to fog up it's not so bad with goggles which I also had so here are my goggles which are wrapped up in a buff one of those things it's like a balaclava so I, I would have had two merino wool balaclavas one synthetic and then i had this buff which you could also <clears throat> use as a handkerchief maybe to wipe your nose or wipe your face or wear it around your neck or as a bandana very similar other than the fact that you can't pull it up over your full head and have that little face opening but i was using that you know as a, as a backup to have a, as, as a backup but it was a case for my goggles just to keep them from getting scratched up so I had a pair of these real windy conditions I used them last year on a trip and uh, they're great really keeps the <coughs> snow and the wind from blasting your eyes just a pair of ski goggles so for keeping the anorak uh, sometimes when it got warm and I wanted some good ventilation I would just leave it as it was, almost like a, a real long kind of skirt. It, it came down just below my knees. and that, But it was very loose. If you wear this and you've seen it on me, the sash, just like a belt, and you tie it on. So uh, it keeps the, the wind from blowing up into the main part of your anorak where your, the core of your body is. It's good for say putting a knife onto it or i've clipped gloves onto it or my uh, garmin inreach so lots of different uses you can use this as a scarf i believe it is wool as well so that could be used as, a, as another scarf it's also good to have in something nice and tight around your stomach and your core muscles especially if you're pulling a heavy toboggan like i was so that was good for me when I stop to have a break, sometimes, of course, as soon as you stop, you're very warm. So you don't really want to layer up, but you should. You try to keep that heat in there because it won't be long once you've stopped and you'll cool off. Especially if you have a tiny bit of sweat going. So for breaks, to keep that heat in, I had a nice Heli Hansen parka. So that came in handy. It also came in handy just cutting wood out around the camp here 
of course the anorak is is big and stuff but it doesn't provide any insulation so if I was just whipping on something quick to go out and chop some wood or get some water I'd use that and I also used it every night as a pillow nice and cushiony something to lay there and I had that and a couple shirts and all these things stacked up to make a nice pillow for myself so it's good for that it's a big size it can also be used to lay underneath your sleeping bag as a, an extra extra insulator or a, on top of you many different uses for that so it's good to have important uh, on a winter camping trip especially for me being in this these cold temperatures maybe you could get by without it in a milder climate so I got some more clothes here in this canvas bag days when it did get really cold some of those days down to the minus 20s minus 30s I had on heavy wool merino wool underlayer medium wool sweater then on top of that I had a fleece so extra layers in the future I'm going to try to replace this fleece with a heavier wool sweater but they're not so easy to come by so ultimately if it got extremely cold I'd have on this base layer my green medium weight wool sweater this fleece then I'd have on the parka then my anorak windshell so that would be for ultimate cold and I was equipped for situations like that in this bag we have an extra pair of uh, thermo here base layer sock then I have another pair of 100% wool socks that I didn't even use so I can save them for the next trip I wore the same two pairs of socks for the entire 27 days I gave the the base layer sock a one rinse but the wool ones I didn't and that's fine a little dirt's not gonna hurt you from time to time it'll only strengthen your immune system so then I had my spear heavy wool base layer I wore that one early in the trip and then I changed up to this fresh one recently I have another pair of gloves for out chopping wood because the wool ones get chewed up pretty easily so these are just uh, a leather shell chopper mitt style again three fingers and if I was heading into a deeper winter we didn't start this trip till mid-march most of the coldest days were over with uh, but for more extreme cold I would I would prefer to have these as just a single mitt but they're good for out chopping wood something like this these are heavy duty high arctic mitts I wore them one one time when it was when the wind chill was in the minus 30s going down to get some water so heavy duty I had them just in case they're called rubber gloves it's made in Winnipeg Canada it says there but they were great I basically had everything I would have took in in the in the deep you know the deep depths of winter and the coldest times of the year because this trip for me was a preparation for future endeavors and I wanted to play it out just like a situation uh, down the road would be I also had a pair of wind pants again wore them only once and I only got them before the trip but extreme winds these heavy cotton pants are not going to break that that breeze so you want to be moving on days when it's nasty out it's nice to have something like that I had a spear binding for my snowshoes lamp wick binding for lashing my snowshoes of course onto my feet the other binding that I have there now is starting to wear out usually happens over time so I took extra with me other than that I had a spare pair of underwear I can go about three weeks or so with the same pair of underwear not gonna hurt you as I said so besides my goggles I had a pair of glasses not bad but it's sunny out not extremely windy they do the job a pair of dark sunglasses when the conditions aren't so bad out I don't want a big pair of goggles on so I took these with a hard shell case when I wasn't wearing them good to have that I've broken many pairs of sunglasses in the past 
by just tucking them in a the bag somewhere, forgetting about them and breaking them. So I took along a hard shell case. For footwear, of course I had my moccasins, which it's too warm now to be wearing those. Once it gets to, you know, minus three, minus four degrees, close to zero, they start to get wet. They're meant for cold temperatures and that's when they're at their best, the coldest temperatures in the world. These are excellent. But when it gets warm, not so much. So inside them, I have a, uh, a liner boot with just a thick felt sole. You lose heat from beneath a lot of times on your feet, the cold coming up. So I had a thick felt sole there around camp. And when the conditions did get warm and I, my, I didn't want my moccasins getting wet, I got these rubber over boots made by Tingly, I believe is the brand. So they fall down to nothing. They're not like a, you know, a normal rubber. Look, it's just like, you can fit that in your pocket almost. So they're good portable rubber for a situation like this, not a stiff boot that is a lot more difficult to pack. So of course, I also had liner for those, which seems to be a bit wet now. And I've been drying those out up above in the loft every so often. So a liner, and then in this one, <laughs> I don't know why, because I had extra. I believe these soles aren't so thick as the ones in my in my moccasin liner. But here we go. We have two felt soles. So there we have it. This is the easiest way to get these uh, liners back into your boot. And you slip your boot on. Like this. Great. Got a nice little piece that comes over here and locks, kind of tightens the boot for you. And then just in case I ran into some very icy situations, I took along a pair of these little cleats that you put on the bottom of your footwear. So that's it for clothing. Other than I have a stash that I keep out on the sled. So, you know, we're way out here in the bush. We're not close to any any bit of help. If I was in a situation, I'm lying in a tent at nighttime, or maybe I go off getting a bit of wood, a spark shoots out of the stove here or somewhere, or maybe something gets so dry it catches on fire. Who knows? We have a fire, the tent burns down, I got the clothing that's on me, but it's always nice to have a little extra clothing and extra food out on the toboggan. So in a bag over here, I kept this on the toboggan the entire trip, never had it in the tent. Was an extra wool toque, extra pair of socks, wool socks, little pair of long johns. These are thinner wool long johns. And I take this with me anyways, rain gear, because you don't know, you might encounter rain in the winter and it's, it's great to be prepared. So this rain gear, this toque, these socks, and this little thin uh, wool long johns could get me out of a jam in case I did have a situation with my tent, you know? And I had to, I didn't have anything left and I had to get back out to civilization. You don't want to mess around. So I had a little stash of clothing in this, in this uh, separate bag, a little bit of food, a few bars, enough to keep you going for a few days. And also in there was my Heli Hansen synthetic balaclava. So that's it for clothing, other than bear stuff. For bear, of course, she got the, the best fur coat you could ever have. But I have her harness right here. A nice, good harness cushioned here with some polyester. So a nice cozy harness for her to be pulling around the toboggan. And then she had her boots. Four pairs of just musher boots that they'd wear for, you know, races like the Iditarod sled racing. That's what, these are the types of booties they put on their dogs. So I had uh, eight with me, but we lost one along the way. Keeps the coal off her paws as we're going all day long. Good for icy conditions that may cut off her feet. Beer has a lot of fur down around her paws. When the snow gets damp and a little wet, 
So she gets balls of snow on her feet and they freeze onto her paws and the fur around her ankles. So wearing the boots prevents stuff like that. So for sleeping, I had a minus 20 sleeping bag. It's in a compression bag that I came in, but to compress it even further, I have one of these blue pull straps. Just got it at Home Depot to make it tight as it possibly can get. And that does, when you're staying in a canvas tent, even the nights when it was around minus 30 and I woke up and the stove had gone out there one evening, I, I didn't find it too bad. <clears throat> Once that happened and I just zipped up the sleeping bag, went back to sleep. I sleep fairly warm. Maybe someone else, <clears throat> uh, someone who doesn't sleep so warm, was in the same sleeping bag they probably would have had to start the stove right away or maybe they'd need a sleeping bag rated for minus 30 degrees celsius all depends on where you're going but minus 20 is certainly uh can work other evenings i did wake up start the stove all is good you always have that there with you and you know it's there as long as you have some sticks to get the fire going when it goes out no worries in the middle of the night if it if it does die down most times I actually just put my feet into the sleeping bag and zip it up a little ways. Then roughly from my knees up is open to the, to the air in the tent. So my body feels when the stove is getting low. Then I wake up and throw more wood in there. There wasn't very many nights where the stove went out and I had to get up and grab my little shavings and get it going. Then I just had this Thermarest foam sleeping pad and then of course I had the tarp over here so I, I was using boughs the entire trip for my for the floor of my tent. Sometimes I put boughs on the entire tent other times I only did about half the tent like I've got done now so over here I had gear laid and beer slept. She of course doesn't mind the cold. I just put the tarp down to cover the snow, a tarp I had. So this sleeping pad was good enough on a, a bed of boughs, you know, four to six inches thick. Also great during the daytime if you want to take a little break. I had this rolled up on beer's sled, you know. So when I took a break, I went back and sat on it instead of sitting in the snow. Or having to cut a few boughs to sit on those. In the future, because it, it is an extra effort getting the boughs in the evening, you know, on top of putting the tent up and getting everything ready and getting wood, having to make the floor takes extra time. So what I might do going forward on long trips is only put boughs around the stove and the kitchen area there where the camera is but the boughs give insulation and it prevents the, the heat from the stove from melting the snow underneath and caving the stove down or tipping it over or whatever could happen. I haven't had issues with it. You watch it, of course. The stove may start to lean one way. Then you get a little stick and you can lay it under one of the legs to kind of balance it out. There is other techniques I've used before where I have put sticks through the there's holes in the legs of the stove and you can put some sticks through there almost the length of the tent so even if the snow underneath melts directly underneath the stove further off in the distance that snow is not going to melt up at the ends of the tent so those sticks will keep the stove level the entire time but that also is extra effort cutting some sticks to to slide through the bottom of the stove but what i might do is only bow the kitchen and the stove area and bring a inflatable sleeping pad which I don't use them because I typically more the, the biggest reason being embers from the fire in the summertime coming out I like to lie by the fire so if I'm not gonna bring a pile of sleeping pads with me so if I bring a foam one I can go out and lay by the fire no worries but if I have just an, an inflatable one gets a burn hole then you got to patch it up it could be ruined who knows but for long trips here in the canvas tent to have an inflatable sleeping pad and then from the stove over to this wall I can keep it all snow 
I can lay a tarp down. Then I can lay down the inflatable sleeping pad. <clears throat> or actually, then I can lay down this first, then the inflatable sleeping pad on top of it. Then I have good insulation. Because if I'm just going with this on top of a tarp and snow, I'm not going to get that same sort of warmth that the boughs give me. So that's it. The sleep system is more or less a few boughs underneath, sleeping pad, and my sleeping bag. And when I go to sleep, I usually have the balaclava somewhere. Maybe it's just rolled down around my neck. If I wake up with my head cold, then I can put it completely on. But I always got it around there. <clears throat> so I have a little comfort for my face in case it does happen to get cold when the stove dies down or goes out. So then I got just a small dry bag with some electronic stuff, batteries, all that kind of headlamps and everything. I have another small dry bag. This was just first aid stuff for me and Bear. You know, all that good stuff and, and cleaning supplies which I put in there. You know, my toothbrush, a, a cloth for washing, uh, some soap and shampoo and that which I did use a couple times cleaning my feet, cleaning my face and all those cleaning those private areas, giving those a rinse uh, and what I used for my little sink was this Tupperware container I brought along I used it to store my thermometer uh, matches and candles basically is what I had in here so what I would do is take everything out and I, I was using it as a counter too, to, to rest my candle on if I didn't make a candle stick, which you've probably seen there, using a, a stick of wood and tying the candle to it with some snare wire. Evenings I didn't do that, you know, I can just rest the candle on this, but then I take everything out of it, fill it up with warm water here from the stove, and then I got a little sink with, with me. So not only can you store items in there, but you can use it as a little washroom or whatever. So we got that. So as we're doing that, we're going to get into the kitchen stuff. So I brought this cookie tin. Inside this, I just keep all my, my salt and my baking powder, uh, sugar, spices, fork. Or I didn't bring a fork with me. I had a spork. I know, and a spoon. One spork, one spoon. Then I had just a little bit of fuel here. I had two cans of isobutane in my mini stove. Just in case, just in case. It's just, it weighs next to nothing. If, just say I had an emergency or something, I fell through the river and it got extremely cold. Couldn't, uh, matches got wet. This thing acts as like, as a blowtorch. You know, you put your canister onto it and it can be a torch to start a fire in a hurry. Doesn't weigh much, so I threw it in. Not absolutely necessary, but I wanted to take it along, see if it was necessary or not. I don't know if I'll bring it in the future. So then I just, I had a Nalgene bottle for going down and getting water at the pond. You want to have a couple bottles around. You don't want to have just one jug and you're making more trips back to get water. The other reason, I had this and I had a thermos. So... I had, an, I had a, a, a smaller thermos. This one here is 1.2 or 1.4 liters. I had a smaller one around 700 milliliters that I decided to leave up in the truck and I took this instead. I probably should have took the, the thermos one because I do believe water will not freeze inside of it unless it gets extremely cold. But water freezes a lot quicker in the Nalgene bottle. Anyhow, that's what I bring. And uh, it was good for going down to get a bit of water or when I was melting snow I would fill up the couple pots I had there and then I'd fill up this stuff <clears throat> so I had a bit of extra water on hand thermos of, of course important basically I was making you know filling that thing up with tea throughout the day so I didn't have to be boiling the kettle when I stopped for a break to melt snow <clears throat> and and more or less I should have had this thing like I said a couple days when it was warm I did have this filled with water to have some extra hydration but throughout a day 
you certainly need you need a fair amount of water in the winter time you're breathing you're losing a lot of a lot of hydration that way as well every time you breathe out you, you see the moisture go up into the ear so you get dehydrated a lot quicker that way so anyhow I brought these two jugs along with me in the future I'll have an insulated water bottle so throughout the day I'll have you know a liter of water and then I'll have another liter or so of tea not coffee because coffee <coughs> dehydrates you a lot quicker than tea and it also stimulates the nervous system more and you'll sweat <coughs> you'll sweat a fair bit more than you would if you didn't drink it so something you want to avoid in the winter time of course I could just have the kettle and when I stop you know I could find a chisel a little hole in the lake or melt snow of course would be the most efficient that way I wouldn't have to take along this stuff you know carrying extra weight so where does the energy where does it level out to you know what's is it worth worth my energy to take along just the kettle for my lunch breaks boil up you know near a liter of water or tea and drink it all and go on and have another break then a few hours later that means I gotta start a fire every time or do I just have it with me then I stop though I'm carrying around more weight throughout the entire trip I'm using less energy to start a fire and melt snow each time I take a break so to me uh, I think that it's kind of an equal operation there you're probably in the long run you'll probably save more energy taking along a couple bottles to have your water and have your tea that's my thoughts on it anyways I'm still experimenting other cookware was just one pot that still got some soup left into it so I had this two liter pot <clears throat> I had my kettle two cups two tiny cups just a little plastic one and then I had this uh, enamel tin cup which you can heat uh, heat up on the stove or on a fire to melt water then I had this little pie pan sheet which I was using to make my bannock in and and pancakes and stuff I was using it as a plate and I had a frying pan so when I was making things such as bacon and grease was flying everywhere or I was baking the bannock I was using this as a lid so that's all I had for cookware besides a, a spork and a and a spoon forgot to mention in my little emergency kit I leave out on the sled I also had a pair of thin wool mittens just in case the tent burned down or something along those lines I don't even want to talk about it so I've been through the bulk of it other than that I had this duffel bag which I was storing a little bit of food in there because I was running out of space <clears throat> with my other food bags I also kept some ammo in here and some stuff for ice fishing I had my uh, 22 410 Savage Arms I think it's called a model 42 takedown so it's a 410 down bottom a 22 up top you have a couple options you have your spread shot through the 410 to hit things that may be on the move and then you got your 22 if you know you have a stationary rabbit or a stationary grouse and you want to try to preserve as much meat as possible you take a headshot so I had that with me so the very top bag on my toboggan was this one here I always had access to it so I kept things like this bag with uh, some maps in it compass solar panel I was keeping my axe this is a medium size Fiskars chopping axe and then I had my collapsible box saw so I was keeping those things within easy reach in that top bag just some rope for beer this is another bag from the toboggan this is the one the stove goes in and then of course there's the big main wrapper on beer's toboggan I had our food and I had this uh, just 
waterproof duffel bag, which I kept my lunch in there. And then I kept uh, just, like if I took off my hat and gloves, whatever I didn't put in the top bag of the toboggan, I kept it in this. And my main reason for bringing this thing along was we went on a couple day hikes. So I could throw that on my back, you know, I didn't, or I could put it on Beer's sled. I didn't have to go taking my big long toboggan. I just had a little day pack. And there's no internal frame in it, so it can be folded up real small. Uh, there's no big heavy straps, just tiny ones. You don't want to bring something that has these internal, inter, internal pack frames. And it's full of straps and things hanging off it that can get hooked up in the stuff. And that can't be folded into a very small bundle like this one can. Uh, this was in the day pack. A bit of sunscreen there. Some extra paracord. Things like that. I've gone over most of it now. Food is over here in this green bag. There's, there's plenty of food left. This for me, as I've mentioned, was a trip to prepare myself for longer winter expeditions where I'm going longer distances without resupplies. So I took about enough food for roughly two months and we had only, we've only been here for 27 days. So I have plenty of food left, but I just wanted to get used to hauling around a full toboggan loaded down with everything we needed for a couple months. I even had enough food for beer for two months. So that's how it is. The rest of the operation here, the rest of the outfit, was just the, the wood stove and the tent, which is an 8x8 eight eight canvas tent made by Snow Trekker. Great little tent, Snow Trekker's tents. And I'm looking around now, can't think of anything else. Of course, we have tripod, camera gear, my Garmin inReach. I had with me one multi-tool, right, a Leatherman on my belt, plus the, the knife I have on my sash belt. So we had two knives with me, two knives, an axe and a buck saw were my real tools that I used. You know, several lighters, bunch of packs of matches, the fire steel, lots of candles. About 30 candles, something like that. I, I figure roughly 15 candles will last me a month on average. I still don't have that down to a science yet, but that's a rough estimate because candles are great to have in the tent at night time. They provide wonderful light and then they just, once they're gone, they're gone. It's not like uh, batteries for the headlamp. Of course, I had plenty of those too, but I would have had a lot more with me if I didn't take the candles. Then when you're done, when the batteries are used up, you gotta carry them around as dead weight. Just thinking of other little odds and ends now. On my phone, I was playing around with Canada Maps Pro. They have all the topographic maps that you would purchase, you know, at your local government building or whatever, or buy them online. They're all here. But I haven't messed around with the GPS portion, the, the tracking aspects of it, and I just played around with it, and it's pretty good because when it's tracking you, unlike my inReach, unless you can download the proper topographic maps for this one too, I haven't looked into it. You know, you get your map, but it's not extremely detailed. Of course, it shows you where you're to. But other than that, with regards to the landscape on the GPS map, it doesn't show all the details. But with this one, you get the topographic government maps, you know, the whatever say one in, in uh and 50 50 000 scale map and you can see exactly where you're to on it when you put the tracking in there so it was it was nice i don't know if it's justifiable to bring along this and the phone though i usually bring my phone or, along for a couple tunes here and there usually it ends up dying on the longer trips it's one of those things that it's it's a last resort to charge this i'm always charging my my in -reach and my cameras. So to be charging up this and this, I don't know if it's if it's worthwhile. I also use my phone as an extra camera. I have a couple books downloaded, but usually once it dies, that's it. I don't usually put effort into charging it up again. 
on my longer trips because its its use is it's not as important. I also took it because I didn't have enough time to get the actual paper topographic maps that I like to take with me. I just had a, a book on, that I had purchased in a store with one and one million scale maps. And I threw them in there just in case. But I didn't have time to get the one and, and 50,000 scale maps or the one and 250,000 scale topographic maps that I like to do. So they were on that app and I, and I brought it along and tried it out. In my pocket I always got this lighter in a waterproof case that was given to me by a friend nice little case for the lighter and I have a little pouch with some ammo in there a little canvas pouch so the final items here now is just this shovel backcountry access is what it's called not a bad little shovel breaks down too in a, a few pieces some of them break down into two pieces but not all of them break down into three like this we have a nice compactable shovel though I did keep it myself as one piece right on top of the toboggan lashed on top as you probably seen for easy access who knows shovel has many uses on a winter trip always great to have one along you can get by using a snowshoe but you'll also beat your snowshoe up that way Other than that, I had uh, the toboggan, which was 12 feet long. That was made by Lure of the North. Wonderful for these types of trips. Great for lugging around a lot of gear. I think the, the more popular model they sell is 8 or 10 foot long toboggans. I could even use 14 feet. I've, I've thought about it. We'll see. If I'm going to go into the bush for say 60 to 80 days on a winter trip I don't know if my 12 footer is going to have enough space to carry everything it's going to be it's going to be close for sure I'm going to have to cut down on some items but it's hard to remove much now from what I have I could probably shave down whew, maybe a bit of clothing I don't know it's, it's very difficult to say Rain gear isn't absolutely necessary. If it did happen to get wet out, I mean that canvas anorak does a decent job of of keeping keeping you dry for a, sh a short time. And I mean, how much rain am I really going to face in the winter? Chances are not much. And if it's bad enough, I'm going to be in the tent, not out moving in it because it'll be miserable traveling unless it's, I'm in a desperate situation. So stuff like that could go, but the 12 foot toboggan is certainly sufficient. Beer is just a, a small, I think it's 40 liter Pelican sled I got from Canadian Tire. Perfect, perfect little sled for a dog to pull behind them. And I think she maxed out at a weight of about 50 pounds she had there at the start. So she had no trouble with it. Then I had my snowshoes, my beer paw snowshoes, made by Lure of the North as well. And then I had the, the chisel there, the ice chisel, which is a two-piece ice chisel. Breaks down, uh, there's a screw piece in the middle, so it's pretty good for storing onto the, the sled. Coming in here at the end of a long day, to keep it short, is I'm gassed. And if I could not have to go down to the pond and spend 30 minutes cutting through all, you know, four or five feet of ice to get my water, I won't. I was I was finding it good just melting snow or going down with the shovel and digging to some slush water and getting that. So the chisel is, I've, I've thought about and Dave from Lure of the North mentioned to me as well that I could just take along the metal top. I had to layer up there, the stove died out. Battery also died. Stuff's falling down behind me. But Dave from Lure of the North was telling me I can just go with the tip of the chisel, just the metal piece, take that along with me, and then I could put the top of the chisel and screw it onto a small wooden pole from out in the out in the bush here and go down and use it, take it apart, 
throw the piece of wood away, and if I need it later on, I can do that. That way I don't gotta carry along that big stick with me. I can save, you know, maybe five or six pounds there. Because ultimately, unless you're fishing in the winter, the chisel is not ne absolutely necessary, depending on what you're doing. So the ice chisel is good for testing thickness of ice. But if you're, if, if you're not going to go fishing, and for, from my perspective, the way I look at it, if I'm going on a long winter expedition, day after day, almost similar to a marathon you're not taking too many days off and if you are you're taking them off to rest not to go down and chisel holes in the ice i may not fish a whole lot on a trip like that i may not fish at all so to have a chisel with me it i can take it but if if i'm careful around ice and i don't need to ice fish i have enough rations with me i have my gun i can use that to get some grouse and partridge and, and rabbit i can use snares to get that kind of stuff but I think I can get by without taking a nice chisel. <clears throat> but it's also nice to have. It's one of those things, it's a very tough decision. So that rounds out the gear that I took along with us on this winter expedition. I hope it helps you out. Helps you plan a winter trip of your own. Whether it be in a canvas tent with a wood stove or coal camping in a normal tent whatever it might be I hope this helps you get out so thanks for watching a special thanks to my patron supporters and we'll catch you in the next video take care and stay outdoors see ya